One of the nations I never got around to in previous Victoria 3 patches was the Ottomans. This quite frankly falling power of the Near East has lots of potential to return to its glory, but only after reforming the Ottoman equivalent of the Ancien Régime. In today's guide, I'm going to be playing as the Ottomans going for the Healthy Man of Europe achievement. It's one of the longer and tougher achievements of the game. I initially had trouble trying to do it in the traditional way, largely because of the somewhat RNG nature of Tanzimat, and the way I'd fall behind powers like Great Britain and France. With patch 1.2, Britain and France end up miles ahead of every other power, and that makes most achievements in the game significantly harder. That being said, I did achieve number one great power, and maximum my public healthcare institution with some difficulty. Let's get into how I did it, and how you can do it too. There is a huge element of randomness in certain mechanics of Victoria 3. Things like passing laws, winning battles, and getting positive or negative events are essentially just random in this game. I'm going to throw in another random element for this run in order to mitigate a different piece of RNG. As the Ottomans, you are effectively required to finish at least 4 Tanzimat journal entries if you want to stand a chance. Before they're done, you have to live with a lot of debuffs and bad events. What if I told you that you can just skip Tanzimat entirely and even get a new Sultan with the interest group of your choice with one neat trick? Simply start a civil war and switch sides. I don't know how I never thought of this in earlier patches, but basically, the revolting nation is counted as a whole new country, albeit for the purpose of this achievement, still the Ottoman Empire. This means all journal entries are gone, and a new sultan is generated on the spot from any interest group. I kept resetting my run until I got a sultan I liked, which in this case was a trade union sultan. To be honest, a preferable choice would likely be the industrialists or intelligentsia since the unions won't get any clout for a very long time, but I made it work. What's more is that by doing this, the landowners get their ideologies reset. They no longer support slavery unless the new landowner leader that gets randomly generated is a slaver, which is pretty rare. Point is, you can keep resetting over and over until you get the sultan you want. Funnily enough, by having a new sultan, there's no guarantee he'll be a member of the Osman Oulu dynasty. That makes the name the Ottoman Empire kind of stupid since the sultan is no longer an Ottoman, but oh well. The best way to create a civil war you'll definitely win is to try and push a republic. No one wants a republic, so you'll get a huge civil war that you're guaranteed to win, barring foreign intervention or something like that. Since we're doing this so early in the run, it's not even a big deal to just keep resetting until things go exactly how you want. Each reset took me about a minute. Maybe it'll take you non-speedrunners two minutes or something. Either way, win the civil war, and then we can begin the run in earnest. With our new Ottoman Empire ready to go, let's engage in our own Tanzimat. First off, we're moving the capital to Mosul. This is because we don't want the capital somewhere vulnerable like Istanbul, but it's a habit in a non-coastal, central location of the country. I would do Ankara, but Ankara state is still coastal in the game. The next thing we do is encourage exports on grain to activate the Corn Laws journal entry. We're hoping for the modern conservative event, which will give a market liberal leader for the landowners. We need that to get off traditionalism. For tech, I don't think you have to follow any particular path, but I like to go down the tree to railroads right away and also grab intensive agriculture. I think starting with early agriculture is really strong, and working towards railroads is good so we can stack up huge industry in our states without infrastructure penalties. In terms of building, the 1.2 patch has changed Baghdad from having an agricultural negative to having a positive, so we're going to build up a nice rice industry between the Tigris and Euphrates so we can cheapen up grain. In general, an economy should start with its basics, and grain is probably the most basic resource out there. It's important to be able to feed people so they'll be relatively loyal. Heavy industry can come later. Once you get modern conservative, between interventionism and laissez-faire, the consensus is that on current patch, interventionism is simply superior. This is because the AI-controlled direct investment pool is extremely bad at making smart investments. That being said, I have it turned off because I don't like it. That means laissez-faire can still be good, but I don't like it as much due to it not allowing me to invest in agriculture and not being able to subsidize. I usually play a rather subsidies-heavy playstyle, so I'm going with interventionism. It's your choice though, based on your own playstyle. The only objectively wrong choice is to play with automated investment pool and laissez-faire economics. Anyway, so far we're doing pretty well. Where the normal Ottomans would be stuck with Tanzimat debuffs, I've already become number 7 great power in 1837. I ended the corn laws at that point to generate a nice mass of loyalists which we can hopefully maintain by building all that rice in Iraq. From here, we have pretty much free reign in the Middle East. I'm not going to get into any large conflicts against, say, Egypt, not yet anyway. I'm instead going to attack the smaller Arab states and just grab them up early before they can become European protectorates. For now, this land is useless, but later it'll have oil. After those short wars, I started to ban slavery. Normally, this is a huge pain as the Ottomans, whose landowners are usually slavers. In this case, though, thanks to the Civil War, there are no interest groups in support of slavery. In fact, the devout are abolitionists. Despite that, it did take me a while to ban slavery just because laws are all percentage chances. In 1842, the law passed as I was preparing for war against Macron. I'm heading into Baluchistan for access to two crucial regions. 
Afghanistan, and Punjab. Afghanistan has opium which we can use to effectively run the economy for a brief period, and Punjab has the best air culture in the game. In patch 1.2, Punjab now has a 20% throughput bonus for not just farms, but also plantations. That means you can make huge amounts of dye, silk, tobacco, and tea, all from just one state. I had a strange occurrence during my time in India, and that was the East India Company starting a play to take Dobruja. When I saw them making a play on me, I assumed it was for Baluchistan, but imagine my shock when they wanted to take a piece of Bulgaria from me. I actually have seen this exactly before in a speedrun in the past on an old patch. I have no idea what causes this, but the only reason I didn't think I had lost my mind was that this isn't the first time this has happened. It was the East India Company and Dobruja in previous cases too. I'm going to take this opportunity to do a base to GigaChad maneuver and demand war operations and conquest of Malaya from the EIC since I know I can get it. During the course of the Malaya conquest, I moved towards racial segregation so I could stop discriminating pretty much every pop in my country east of the Balkans. It passed mostly without a hitch, and now I consider our new Ottoman state to be relatively reformed. We've got a growing economy, no slavery, and a reduction in discrimination. Before ending the Tanzimat era, there are two more conquests to do, Persia and Afghanistan. These wars were simple because no other great power had an interest in the Persia region, so it was just me against Persia to puppet, and then me against Afghanistan to conquer. Where in real life, Afghanistan is almost impossible to conquer, in Victoria 3, they're a pushover. Tanzimat is complete, and the Ottomans are ready to take their place as the greatest power in the Victorian era. They just have to industrialize. The choice of what to build is always of huge importance for any nation, and that's so different from the Ottomans. My first interest is to get off of wood-based construction and get to iron construction. The way we do this is by building lots of iron and coal in eastern Turkey, along with some tools. For now, it doesn't matter where you build them. Our goal, though, is going to be employing as many of our pops as possible. Your budget is going to tank due to this change, but trust me, it's important to get building quickly, even if it means the budget takes a hit. I was on lowest taxes during the switch because I knew that if I really needed to, I could just raise taxes to avoid debt. You'll notice that as you build more and more iron, your budget will get healthier and healthier. Since iron is the largest good to purchased for iron buildings, reducing its price will drastically increase the budget. By 1855, I was still on the lowest tax rate and I hit 30 million GDP with only a slight budgetary deficit and 110 construction points. This isn't the best it could possibly be, but it certainly isn't too bad. The jury is more or less out when it comes to max taxes against lowest taxes. To be honest with you, I lean more and more into just maxing out taxes and spamming buildings. I like having the legitimacy, but man, if I were on max taxes, I could probably double or even triple my construction points. The only reason to be careful about max taxes is it can result in a ton more radicals, and with turmoil in states reducing construction efficiency, it might be a bad idea to aggressively tax people. I have to play more to make my firm decision on high versus low taxes, so I'll leave it up to you. You'll notice that my budget has collapsed again, but that's only because I'm building universities across the country right now, which the investment pool can't cover. I'm doing this because our workforce lacks qualifications, and because we need to get all the way to antibiotics tech, which is a level 5 society tech, in order to max out healthcare. We'll need the innovations and qualifications, so universities are important. I usually build one university in every state with the hope that they'll generate enough qualifications to avoid future employment issues. I'm also hoping to pass religious schools to increase literacy, which will let us research faster. I only delayed the schools this long because I was lacking bureaucracy. You'll notice that the chance for it to pass is 0%, and that's because the only interest group I have in government that supports it is the trade unions, who have less than 1% clout. That means that although I can begin passing the law, it will never pass, in theory. In reality, I can still get events on each attempt that increase success chance, so I'm trying anyway. After failing to get schools in, I decided to instead try and get census suffrage, again with almost a 0% chance. I was sort of messing around while I was waiting for my buildings to get built. I was building up various industries where infrastructure was available, I had some arms industry so I could help my budget, and some government bureaucracy here or there, but the big investment coming up was the opium in Afghanistan. Although Afghanistan is a territory, which means you can't tax anyone there, the aristocrats that run the plantation can still invest in the investment pool, which will effectively increase the budget, as well as skyrocketing the GDP. A higher GDP increases minting, so we'll be able to print more money for the budget. Essentially, pro tip for any country, conquer Afghanistan and just spam opium. It's so immensely profitable, and you can even export it once you produce it nice and cheaply. It'll generate tariffs, increase GDP, and make for some huge investment pool contributions. Keep an eye on my GDP as the opium plantations get built. Upon starting the first opium plantation, I'm at 33 million GDP. It's 1858. Skip to 1860, and all I've built is opium. My GDP is now 37.5 million, and my budget is back to being positive. The next industry I'm going to build into is textiles. While opium is great, it's limited by the fact that only so much agricultural land exists for it. Textiles do not have this limitation. Since clothes are pretty much always in demand, textiles are great because they employ pops in good jobs and produce highly profitable goods. We're going to need dyes and silk for that, which means it's time to grab the sick empire. Although I'm scared Britain might get involved against me, I'm doing this with the hope that they won't. 
Pumping the sick empire will be great for the budget, since they'll pay me a couple thousand pounds per week, but later on we'll be integrating them so we can develop their agriculture for them. Since I don't have railways set up yet, I can't put down too many textiles industries for now, but even just a couple has increased the GDP and budget pretty nicely. I'm also going to build some furniture to try and get my pops to be a little more loyal. In case the budget was at all a concern, I managed to pass proportional taxation despite the landowner's protests. I was able to do this by making the difficult choice of not going to per capita taxation. It sucks to be stuck on land taxation, but because I was on that law, I was able to use the trade unions and armed forces to move straight to proportional taxes. Now the budget is huge and we can expand the construction zones even more. I now have 245 construction points with only a slight budgetary deficit, which will get solved as we create more and more industries that generate dividend taxes. Remember that the big selling point of proportional taxes is that they have a dividend tax. That means the profits on industries in incorporated states get taxed right into the budget instead of only taxing the income of citizens. 1863, I finally passed religious schools, meaning we can start getting the literacy rate up. It was also in this year that I started building railways everywhere. With railways, we can really start cranking out industry. Much of Anatolia has hundreds of thousands of pops to employ. The only problem is most of them can't read, which makes it hard to give them good jobs. I also, at this point, tried just raising taxes to fix the budget since I didn't want to slow my construction sector, nor did I want to keep going into debt. Now that I'm creating jobs for everyone, we should see the income of the pops increase in such a way that balances out their loss of standard of living from taxation. I was immediately having problems with qualifications at Ankara with my tool workshops, who are basically at constant half-employment due to lack of engineers and machinists. The only way to solve this, unfortunately, is to just wait until the pops start going to school more. My literacy rate is around 25%, and there's no way to make that go up without just waiting until the schools we implemented before start to work. On the positive side, the GDP hit 50 million in 1867, which was also the same year that Canada was confederated in real life. I was also annexing the Sikh Empire at this time, since I wanted to go and build up their agriculture. Once I annexed them, I queued up a ton of agriculture, railways, and construction zones, which take a long time to get built for sure, but which eventually will basically carry my economy. I also saw that Egypt fell to being a minor power, so I did a puppet play on them. Despite Britain's intervention, Egypt fell thanks to a naval invasion in Cairo. I capitulated Egypt, then just waited out Britain until they white peace. By the way, remember all those buildings I queued up in Punjab? Yeah, Punjab separated and undid all those buildings, so that sucks. I put them down, then queued it all up again. Anyway, from here, the economy just sort of keeps on chugging. Keep checking states with unemployed pops and build profitable industries there, with the hope that they will eventually get the necessary qualifications to get employment. By 1872, I hit 75 million GDP and was number 4 great power. I'm going to more or less move on from the economic surge part of the run and focus on some great power politics now. In patch 1.2, Britain and France are extremely powerful due in part to their more intelligent AI and their strong start in general. Unfortunately, with how the game is currently, the only way to really surpass these immensely powerful nations is to go to war eventually. You can try and outpace their economy, which I have been doing to some extent. My GDP isn't too far behind Britain and France, but I simply cannot overtake them in the limited amount of time available in the game. Even after annexing Egypt in 1877, I still only had 110 million GDP, which is pretty far behind Britain, but I had a trick up my sleeve. When I annexed Egypt, Britain intervened, and I wanted to test a theory that I had about invading London. You see, in previous patches, the eponymously coined two-boat strat was a way to land in any country by sending two naval nations staggered by one day against a piece of land with no garrison. It was extremely overpowered, but was later fixed by making it so that the AI often kept a garrison in their regions, even if they weren't afraid of a naval invasion. This sparked the three-boat strat, which involved sending one navy to distract the enemy navy, one landing army to fight an inevitably losing battle, and a third one to successfully land since only one battle can occur on a front at a time. It was time to test four-boat strat. In the new patch, multiple battles can occur on one front, but the question is whether or not units already in battle can fight on two fronts. In theory, if there are, let's say, 50 battalions garrisoned in England, they can fight off an invading army. If all 50 are fighting, can they fight another invading army at the same time as the one they're currently fighting? My guess is no. Let's find out. I recruited four admirals and made sure they had at least one flotilla available. I sent the smallest navy and smallest army to invade London. The first fleet is to distract the British fleet. I sent a second fleet with a similar army and fleet size. This one would get past the Royal Navy and begin a hopeless battle against at least some of England's garrison. I then sent a third fleet with an actually large army to see if it could land. I was still testing three boat strat here in case it still worked. Turns out my trick of four boat strat wasn't even necessary, as things worked out even with only three boats. The first fleet was locked in combat in the channel, the second fleet began a battle, and the third one landed in London without resistance. With that, London is occupied, and I am now armed with the knowledge of how to destroy every great power in the game. That means it's time to build up a massive army and go after France and Britain so we can cut them down a few pegs. I need them to get stunted now rather than later, since later on they're only going to get stronger. In 1878, I'm at 1836 prestige, while France, who is the number 2 power, is at 3570. 
Britain was somewhere around 5k. There was no way I could get that much prestige without war. I'm going to time skip to 1882 where I declared a play to grab London and the Midlands. I was going to liberate the Raj, Scotland, and Canada with the hopes of dethroning Britain as number one power. America intervened on Britain's behalf, which was sort of annoying but inconsequential in the face of four boat strat. So I once again sent a distraction fleet, waited a day, then sent a distraction army, followed by an actual landing army, and then just for safety, another landing army. This was the true four boat strat. Time skip to the fleets arriving, and let's watch the magic. One fleet is caught in the channel, one army begins fighting, and the third one lands, and guess what? The fourth one also lands. I now control from Kent to Hull in one instantaneous snap of my fingers. This war is basically already over now. All I have to do is defend my place in London. The AI can't possibly get to my capital of Mosul on account of it being inland, and they can't get all their war goals, since one of them is Bosnia-Herzegovina. Good luck getting there. I'm losing battles in Punjab, but I don't really care all that much. They can push all they want in India, but I have London. Even as they are pushing into Persia and basically slowly marching through the Zagros Mountains to try and reach Mosul, Britain was ready to surrender. This war, as devastating as it might look, only took Britain down to number 2, leaving France at number 1. I've created probably the most cursed Canada to ever exist, so sorry for that. As a Canadian, I'm very triggered by this. Time skipping again to 1886, I went to war with France to take Picardy, free Occitania, and Brittany, and to open their market alongside a humiliation. The reason for those last two is that they each cut a quarter of nations' prestige, so I can cut France's prestige in half alongside taking Picardy and releasing those nations. America once again intervened, and I sneezed. America's support could not stop for boat strat. Despite France's capital being inland, I can at least get a landing done so I can fight my way to Paris without needing to win a naval landing or a naval battle. Early enough though, it turned out France was somehow able to resist for boat strat, which meant I had to innovate upon old strategies. If their garrison was so massive that they could fight three simultaneous battles, the only real solution was to increase the number of boats. More generals and more admirals were recruited, and this time not just four boats, but instead, seven navies were loaded up with varying numbers of soldiers sent out to the beaches of Normandy and Calais. France couldn't beat seven boat strat, and so the men landed on the beaches of Normandy and pushed on to Paris. From there, the Ottoman soldiers hunkered down in defense mode and waited to win the war. France's actual ability to fight is much greater than Britain, but horrifically enough for me, they too had a card up their sleeve. It turns out that the French tactic of protesting in the streets was the hard counter to seven boat strat. Indeed, by having a well-timed revolution, Every war goal I had put up was invalidated, and now this war was literally a complete waste of time. Sadly, it seems even 7 boat strat can be defeated. No matter, we'll just have to cut down whichever of these French nations comes out on top later. At least France, as a result of their revolt, went bankrupt, sending them down to number 6 great power. Britain was still number 1 though, so my work wasn't done. I decided to humiliate Britain, liberate Ireland, and liberate Australia. Although it might seem like I wouldn't need to use the naval agents to win this war, Britain's capital got moved to Ulster, as hilarious as that is. So I ended up naval invading Ireland using the whatever number boat strat. I was able to throw Britain down to number 4 great power, although now America and North Germany were creeping up in power. I really didn't want to cut down the Germans, since Berlin is not easily accessible, so instead of fighting them, I decided to just spam out barracks to inflate my prestige. Thus began the great arms race of the Ottoman Empire. Essentially, out of laziness more than anything else, I just started spamming art and armies to increase prestige. I hit number one power in 1892, and now all that was left was to get maxed out public health care. Over the course of the rest of the run, I'd occasionally get dethroned as number one power, but I'd reclaim it by just making more barracks. Nothing to worry about. Uh, I'm gonna go walk off. I'm gonna go walk off this uh, this sugar. Don't worry, I'll be back. In 1895, I literally just left the room to go for a walk while I waited for my tech to increase. There's nothing more to do really besides wait. Since at this point, any moment of weakness can be patched up with more barracks. If you're curious about my economic choices, I'm just building anything that's profitable wherever there are pops that are unemployed. I don't have any grand plan here, I just check what goods are expensive and build manufacturers for that good until they're not profitable and watch my GDP climb. I could run the economy more effectively and try to get to steel buildings and stuff like that, but I just really don't need to. For the purpose of this run, it's over. The most interesting occurrence I saw was a Ching explosion, which I've never seen before in almost 500 hours of game time. It looked pretty cool. Time skipping over to 1905, I researched antibiotics and put my healthcare to level 5, thus completing this achievement. There were no notable events along the way besides a brief English separation which put me down to number 2 great power. I took the position back after making a few hundred battalions and taking England back. It took me 7 hours to do this achievement live, and if you want to see the full run, I'll link the stream VOD in the description. So that's the Ottoman Empire. The best way to play them is to not play them, by getting a new Sultan via a civil war and ignoring Tanzimat. I hope you enjoyed this guide. I'm going to make more guides for other achievements and nations of the game with the hope of tweaking my advice to suit the new patch. 
I'm going to keep Autonomous Investment off for the time being because I don't like the new system, which means if you are dead set on playing with it, I'm sorry, but much of these guides won't work for you. I've got a video essay coming which will discuss some of my feelings about the new patch, but I'm going to focus on just one mechanic per video essay. Check out the most recent community post if you want to vote on which one I cover first. Right now, my thoughts on private ownership are winning, so vote before it's too late and be heard. Also, subscribe and check out my Twitch. I stream there and here on YouTube, but Twitch tends to have a less cringe chat, so it's better over there. Thank you for your time.